a sequel 50 years in the making. But what designs does the devil have in this first installment of a planned trilogy? This is the Exorcist Believer ending explained. Believer begins in 2010, when Victor Fielding and his wife are vacationing in Haiti. The couple are awaiting the birth of their daughter, whom they've already named Angela. There are a few homages to the original Exorcist, beginning a long string of visual and thematic references. The movie opens with a shot of two dogs fighting, in the same fashion as some other dogs did when Father Marin approached the statue of Pazuzu in Iraq. Unfortunately for Victor, the opening of Believer ends much more poorly for him than it does for Father Marin. After an earthquake rocks a city, Victor must choose whether to save the life of his unborn child or his mortally injured wife. Thirteen years later, Victor is now a single father, raising his teen daughter Angela in the suburbs of Georgia. Angela's a bright, headstrong, and progressive girl, perhaps due to her father's protectiveness. When Angela asks if she can study with a friend of hers after school, Victor tries to convince her to just come straight back home with him instead. Still, Victor agrees to let Angela hang out with her pal Catherine. Much like young Reagan McNeil was playing with a Ouija board in the original film, Angela and Catherine aren't planning on studying after school. Instead, they go off into the nearby woods to conduct a ritual in the hopes of contacting Angela's dead mother. After the two girls don't return home that night, Victor, along with Catherine's parents Miranda and Tony, begin looking for their missing children. The next three days pass with no sign of the girls, their story becoming a sensation within the local community. At the end of those three days, a local farming family discovers the girls hidden in the back of their barn, barefoot, with no memory of what has happened to them. Angela and Catherine are whisked away to the nearby hospital, where they're subjected to a barrage of tests, examinations, and rounds of questioning. With authorities and their parents initially assuming the worst, everyone is somehow more disturbed to learn that there have been no instances of sexual or physical assault on the girls, nor are there any hints of them being abducted or otherwise detained. According to the girls, they conducted their ritual in the woods, it started to rain, and they began walking only to find themselves lost. Most troublingly, both Angela and Catherine think it's only been a matter of hours that they've been missing. Baby, you've been gone three days. Miranda, a devout Baptist, has her theory about the girl's behavior. Demonic possession. In addition to the girl's bizarre story and increasingly erratic behavior, she cites the missing three days as evidence. As the story goes, after Jesus Christ was crucified, he went down to hell to assert his dominion over all in that realm, before returning to Earth three days later. While Tony doesn't quite back up his wife's claim, he agrees that wherever those girls went, they brought something back with them. Sure enough, things begin to deteriorate once Angela and Catherine are brought back to their respective homes. In Angela's case, she begins acting distant and eerie, making nonsensical comments and seemingly speaking to thin air. Then, upon attacking her father with her mother's old scarf before going into violent convulsions, Victor is forced to take her to intensive care, where she's isolated and restrained. Running out of options, Victor takes a tour of a local psychiatric institute, and the disturbing behavior he sees there recalls Damien Karras visiting his mentally ill mother in the original film. At the end of his rope, Victor is visited by his neighbor Anne, a nurse at the local hospital who helped treat Angela. Anne confesses that she used to be a nun in training, and abandoned that life after she became pregnant and decided to terminate the pregnancy. Admitting that she never told anyone else of this before, she reveals that a possessed Angela knew her secret name as well as her history. The body and the blood. The body and the blood. Anne gives Victor a book written by Chris McNeil, Reagan's mother. In the 50 years since the events of the original Exorcist, Chris became a writer, investigator, and believer, seeking to help others in situations like she was in all those years ago. Victor tracks Chris down, pleading for her help in person. Although Chris is quick to point out that she's only become an expert in exorcism and not an exorcist herself, she agrees to try and help. We've met before. Mother. Victor and Chris go to visit Angela, giving some more credence to the former about what predicament his daughter is in. As Chris approaches, Victor realizes that Angela has carved Reagan into the wall, confirming that the demon inside the girl knows the older woman. The demon also knows that Reagan is a sore spot for Chris. After publishing her story and speaking on it publicly, Reagan severed ties with her mother out of anger at being made a public figure. Chris confesses to Victor that she often wishes she could see her daughter's face again. Deciding to visit Catherine and her family next, Chris and Victor discover Catherine's home in complete disarray. Chris confronts the girl and believes she sees an opportunity to draw Catherine's spirit back into control of her body. Unfortunately, it's just the demon playing a trick, and the possessed girl takes a crucifix and stabs it into Chris's eyes repeatedly. Chris is rushed off to a hospital, leaving Victor, Miranda, and Tony wondering what to do next. 
The parents finally reach out to the local Catholic priest, Father Maddox, to petition the Vatican for the ability to perform an exorcism. Meanwhile, they assemble a team of practitioners of various faiths to help. Although Father Maddox tells the group at the last minute that the church has deemed the girl's situation as not worthy of an exorcism, Anne rallies the group to move forward. As the exorcism begins, each member of the group tag-teams their way toward expelling the demon from the girls, with the demon attacking them back in turn. The demon, of course, proves to be a cunning and formidable opponent, striking two huge blows during the ceremony. In one, Father Maddox decides to ignore the orders of the church and join the exorcism. Sadly, it provides an opening for the demon, and his neck is violently ripped away from the rest of his body. The demon, through Angela, then decides to attack the one member of the group who's yet to admit his belief, Angela's father, Victor. The demon reveals that, way back in Haiti when Victor was given a choice between saving his wife or the unborn Angela, he told the doctors to save his wife. The demon mocks Victor, questioning why he's fighting to save his daughter now when he didn't back then. Although not explicitly discussed in the body of the film, according to the official production notes for Believer, the demon possessing Angela and Catherine is not Pazuzu, the demon who possessed Reagan. Instead, it's a Mesopotamian demon named Lamashtu. After the revelation about Victor and the terrible choice he had to make 13 years prior, Lamashtu delivers a new ultimatum, one confirmed by the rest of the group present. Choose which girl will be allowed to survive. Victor and Miranda see through this choice for the manipulative lie that it is, and refuse to comply. Instead, Victor affirms his love for Angela, demonstrating his belief in both her predicament as well as the power of the exorcism to stop it. Unfortunately, Lamashtu's deception works on one member of the group, a distraught Tony, who can't help himself from proclaiming his choice that his daughter should live. This means that Lamashtu, ever the trickster, decides to keep Catherine. In a recent interview with Slashfilm, director David Gordon Green revealed that one of the girls dying was not always the case for Believer. But as Green said, I wanted to make sure that there was always a mark for the demon on the scoreboard. As such, we see Catherine's soul dragged down into the underworld as she dies, which is either an indicator of her fate or a potential setup for her to return in some fashion in a sequel. I don't want to go to hell! As Believer draws to a close, the surviving characters are all seen finding various ways of coping with their new reality. Tony and Miranda are, understandably, devastated at their loss. Angela is back in school, and while she seems fully back to herself, it's not clear how much of her possession she remembers. Anne attempts to debrief local law enforcement about the entire ordeal, explaining in voiceover all about her philosophy that perhaps devout religious belief isn't required of every single human being on the planet in order to further the cause of good. What may be needed instead is a strong sense of community, togetherness, and tolerance. It's a fascinating counterpoint to the message delivered by Green with this Halloween trilogy, which looked at the persistent recurrence of evil and how it poisons small towns and the world alike. The exorcist believer seems to put its mystery of faith within the way people can be stronger together. Although her sight has been cruelly stolen from her by the demon, Chris's faith and hope to see her daughter again is rewarded, as Reagan appears in her hospital room to reconcile. Does Reagan's presence, given that she's connected to Pazuzu after a fashion, mean more than just burying the hatchet with Chris? Have we seen the last of Lamashtu, Pazuzu, or other ancient demons? Whether the next planned installment of Green's trilogy, The Exorcist Deceiver, happens or not, the battle of good versus evil will never end.